and we're left with just enough money to live on. Now, um, I've been talking to businesses, and one answer that I really liked was uh, um, uh, this business owner said that that uh, if you know, he said, I, I pay my employees fifteen dollars an hour. Now, I don't need a law to do that, but. Do we want businesses that require laws to have them do the right thing in our neighborhoods? Wouldn't we rather have businesses that know how to budget for proper pay for their employees to be working in their neighborhoods so that uh, people who live here will have the expendable income to go to the places that basically ex expect their workers to live off the tips? You know, which uh, which shouldn't be counted as part of your wages. Uh, I think uh, I think that uh, uh, everyone deserves a living wage, not a minimum wage, but a living wage. And as soon as we get to the point where we have living wages, we will have living neighborhoods. We will have neighborhoods where people are feeling better, where people have money to spend uh, in the neighborhoods. <coughs> Thank you. Now we'll be moving to our fifth and final moderated question. What is your view of the Richmond Cares program, a proposal that aims to keep families in their homes by reducing mortgage debt for underwater homes through the utilization of eminent domain? And we're starting with Charles Ramsey. You're going to get with me a difference of opinion, and I don't support the Richmond Cares program. I've been consistent about it. I don't think that it is something that the city really can be a part of the eminent domain process. I'm a lawyer, I understand what it is, what the real public purpose for the measure would be and the impacts that it would have. I think the bigger issue is taking on the county assessor and finding ways that they can deal with that issue. So if that is your sort of litmus test, I'm not going to pass because I don't support it the Richmond Cares program. I don't think the city is able to implement it. I think that one thing you'll find out with me, I'm gonna be open with you and tell you clearly how far, but I don't support the Richmond Cares program. I was a supporter of the Richmond Cares program and looked pretty good. They guaranteed us in writing that if there was a lawsuit that MRP, the private company in San Francisco that wants to make big bucks doing this, that they would insure us and then they found out they couldn't buy insurance for it. Why? Because the industry threatened a twenty million dollar suit. So we think about all the progress we make. You know, homicides down sixty seven percent. Pothole steps. We save the schools. Unemployment as bad as is is about forty three percent less than it was a few years ago. So we think about all that progress and think about it. A lawsuit, which even their own attorney, MRP's own attorney, when I asked him, I said, "Is there maybe a five percent chance we lose this?" And he said, "I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no." So think about it. I know we're all mad at the jerks in Wall Street, and they, you know, they, they brought the economy to a standstill, almost bankrupt the whole nation. I know we're all mad at them. I know this feels good, but think about the risk to us. Is it really an acceptable risk for a program which, if it's found to be legal, which it may or may not be, will help maybe 30, 40, 50 homeowners who are not in default? Does that really risk even a minor chance we get a $200 million lawsuit? Fire police, librarians, parks, job training people, et cetera, et cetera. Is that really worth it? I don't. I think it's crazy. I think it's a bad gamble. I understand the politics of it. I get the politics. But we got to think about this. First time the city of Richmond ever, ever let a private company potentially make millions of dollars of us holding the bag if we get a big loss. First time ever. Is that the legacy that this council wants to be remembered for? Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> um, I'm very sympathetic um, to this challenge in that I lost my home in 2008 after making balloon payments. And as soon as you make balloon payments, you realize you got to make another one. I know the pain of not being able to sleep. However, uh, there's some challenges with the care program for me, and the first of which. Um, no other city in the U.S., to my knowledge, has done it successfully. Um, there's a challenge, as far as I know, how much of the loans, what percentage could be insured. Um, number three, 
if the banks don't agree to a fair price, and you know banks love to agree with homeowners on a fair price, right? If they don't agree to a fair price, you can end up in court. Um, that's a challenge, and when you're losing your house, you want to go to court too? No, um, but I'll tell you what I do like. I do like the fact that you can get the lenders to the table to wrestle with them, because it could be in their best interest to rewrite a more reasonable loan. Um, so I like that, and I like Richmond stepping out in the front and looking out for people and their living conditions. I just wish we could start with Hacienda and Nystrom Village and Nevin Plaza. So every day I get up in the morning, I get in my car, like some of you, we take a risk getting into a car accident, right? Every day we risk something. Some risks are worth taking when the, when the reward is incredibly great. And so, yes, it could be there is a slight risk, but what about the outcome of that? We've heard that it's not going to affect our credit rating as a city. It did not affect us, our bond issuance. It did not do any of those things. But when you have real estate in realtors and real estate investors who want to come in and, and make a big profit at our expense, you're going to have uh, you're going to have a pushback. And and I believe that that's a pushback and a fight worth having. People are watching us all over the world, all over the country, because they are afraid of doing it, because they've been threatened. North Las Vegas wanted to do this program, and, and they were threatened. In fact, realtors ended up putting their own candidates in office, and they squashed it. But right now, we have an opportunity in Richmond to make this program work. We need five votes, and you have five options uh, when it comes to your votes. You have an option for mayor, you have four options for city council, and I ask that you think about who those are so that you can vote for that because it's going to help our city. Damian King, so I have to be absolutely honest, I'm not as connected to this issue as, or informed as some of the other uh, candidates and incumbents. Um, and you're talking to a renter who has dreams of living in a shipping container someday. So, honestly, go to YouTube, shipping container homes, incredible. So, um, but what I can uh, assure you is that um, I can process this information. I can listen to both sides. I do believe that we are a very innovative city and I'm open to innovation. I'm open to opportunities to explore this. I would love to talk to some homeowners who who could benefit from this program. I think that's extremely important. But I also, as uh, uh, um, Pastor Washington said, I would love to bring the lenders back to the table um, and, and so that we can negotiate. But again, I think it's important to hear from those individuals who would benefit from this program. Um, I'm not opposed to it. I'm not an uh, avid supporter. Again, I'm not, I'm not a homeowner, so I'm not as closely connected. But I definitely know some people who have lost their homes uh, since 2008. And so I would love to hear from individuals who um, could benefit from this program so that I can be educated more on how this could work and benefit our community. I am a homeowner of 20 years. Um, but I do, I don't support this, uh, this bench, certainly, uh, for the various reasons that have been stated by the other council folks. But more importantly, I do uh, encourage and I do support uh, the team effort that went along with it uh, to get together to put some, such a uh, a vigorous item on the agenda and to go forward with it. Uh, but we have to look at everything, not just back room stuff. But we have to look at everything, every measure, uh, the intent, and certainly the outcome. Uh, like I said, as a homeowner, I, I didn't uh, uh, look at it. For others that are uh, more uh, significantly uh, could be involved in it, um, that's on them. That's why everybody has an individual, uh, not only voice, but their own opinion. Uh, but I, I didn't support this, and I'm not supporting this. Thank you. Um, the banking industry has created an, an economic injustice in the housing arena. The lives of many families have been disrupted by foreclosures, and the banks are unwilling to be of assistance. 
The Richmond CARES program, which assists families and homes with underwater mortgages, is essential to counteract the callousness of the banking industry. Many foreclosed homes in Richmond are being bought with cash by investors who hope to have the mortgages paid by the renters while they wait for the value of the houses to rise to a profitable level. Rent control is needed to prevent rent abuse from these investors. Now, I have a friend who tried to purchase a home nine times, and eight of those nine times, the house was bought from under him by investors with cash, because banks would rather have cash than to have a mortgage. So investors, which are made up of banking groups, are keeping us out of our homes after they kick, 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 kick us out. So we need this program to tell the banks that we are working together for our people, not for banking interests. I most definitely support helping our struggling homeowners avoid foreclosure. That is completely what this program is about. Because of the economic crisis that we went through nationwide in Richmond, homes lost on an average 66% of their value. 16% of homes in Richmond were lost to foreclosure. And we still have, in most of our neighborhoods, 30 to 15% of the homes underwater, which means they can't, their mortgage is far more inflated than the actual value of the home. And what this program does is it does what economists everywhere say needs to be done to really provide a full recovery to our, our economy. What it does is create principal reduction. That means that we offer to purchase the mortgages at fair market value, either voluntarily having the banks sell them to us, or through eminent domain, you using our authority as a local government to acquire these loans and to reduce the principles in line with home values. And that allows for more affordable mortgage payments. So our homeowners have money in their pockets so they don't have to skimp on um, paying, buying school supplies for their kids or making repairs for their homes. This is absolutely essential, essential for sustainable families, sustainable neighborhoods, and a sustainable local economy. We need to be bold and innovative, and the risk is so minute. We're doing everything to showcase that we have all the uh, legal protections in place. Great, thank you. And this is going to conclude the moderated questions. Now we're going to move down to the um, audience questions. And I have to say, we did receive an overwhelming amount of audience questions. Unfortunately, of course, you all know, we won't be able to ask all the questions this evening. We don't have time for all of them. But we will be consolidating all the questions submitted and sharing them with the candidates. And so for this uh, part of the agenda, the candidates will have one minute, so 60 seconds to answer the question and we'll be rotating in alphabetical order where we left off. So we have two questions. Andres is going to help me ask the question. Okay. So first question is, um, what are your views on Citizens United, the Supreme Court decision, and the way it is unfolding in Richmond specifically? Do you believe that corporations, uh, spending corporations millions of dollars on our election uh, undermines at least uh, the concerns of one person, one vote? So I guess it um, starts out next with Jim Rogers. Yes, Jim Rogers. I think that uh, this whole problem is one of the reasons why this country isn't doing well in a lot of ways. Uh, we have federal, state, national, city. We have a cancer of money. Again, uh, we're all going to say we hate it. I'm the one that's done something about it. I put a ballot measure on in Richmond for public financing. It didn't work, kept after it, brought public financing in, and we actually passed it. And it doesn't protect against whatever game Chevron is playing. And Chevron is very sophisticated. They do their polling. They, they go with front runners. Uh, they are 
not going to be able to buy this election. I think that there are too many people who are too clear that Chevron has an interest. So I suggest when you get the mailers, whether they go support, oppose, whatever, ignore it. Look at other information to try to figure out who's really going to protect your interests. And um, I have another meeting scheduled. I unfortunately have to leave. I thank you very much for your time. You want to start this way, or did you want Thanks. To? Next will be me. We're no. Um, Javon. We'll come back to Javon. Yes. Okay. Rogers, Washington. Okay. Um, so I think Citizens United is a travesty for our democracy. Uh, when when it first came, uh, happened, our president looked at looked at the justices and said, "You ought to be ashamed of yourself." So the fact that uh, it happened and it continues to happen, and I don't know if some of you have even heard that not only are corporations now people and can spend as much money as they want to, now they even get to lie, and that's legal. They can so they can lie and spend a lot of money. Wow. <laughs> Right? That's my reaction as well. It's disgusting. And how do we deal? How do you deal with that? Well, you can. You know who's paying for it by turning over those mailers that you get, and you can see it says paid for major funding by. Some say major funding by Chevron. Some say major funding by the California Realtors Association. Some of it says all kinds of things. So, so that's how we know what's going on, and we can. We can. We can. Um, we can win this. Uh, and, and show them that we will not stand for it any longer. I think people are a lot smarter than they were 60 years ago. And I don't mean just more, you know, I think people are more intelligent with regards to rhetoric and stuff like that. So I just want to say that um, I think that I wish that it wasn't a Supreme Court decision and that it could have been brought back to a legislative body. I think they should have made the decision. But I think it comes down to the integrity of, of the politician, of the people that we elect. You know, I think that um, you can tell who who those individuals are, who are bought, who are influenced by uh, corporate dollars and funding. So I think that people and the use of technology. I think that if you get one mailer in, in the mail, every, everything that comes through my mail it, it goes straight to the trash now. You, you know, so one is not necessarily more than a hundred. I think that that's how people feel about this. So I don't think that people are over influenced by some of the things that come in the mail. It's just a lot of garbage and trash. But I think that it really comes down to the integrity of the individuals that we as citizens elect. Well said, Nick. And I concur with that. Uh, this is not about corporations. It's about integrity of the individuals that are up here and those that are not here. Do you know the person? Have you seen that person in the community? Is he trustworthy? Is he credible? Is he dependable? Is he reliable? Is he a leader? Is he a follower? That's what you have to look at. Not about what you get in the mail. It never has been. Do you know the person? Do you know their mind? Do you know their thought process? Are they passionate about what you say to them? Are they listeners? This is what we're looking at. Can they carry a message? Can they be your voice? Or are they just a shadow? That's what you have to look at. Just remember you are what you settle for. Settle for the best in selection. Well, I wish I had the time to have a conversation with every person in Richmond. Because I know that if I had a conversation with every person in Richmond, that they would see that I am someone who cares about the community. They would see that I do think about how to make Richmond a better place. But unfortunately, I don't have the time or the means to have a conversation with everyone. So that means that the majority of people in Richmond are going to base their idea of who I am based on what they get in the mail or what they see on the internet or what they see in the newspapers. So, that means that whatever person or whatever organization, uh, since corporations are people, are going to be able to lie about me and make all the people who don't see me and know me think that I'm an anarchist. 
to think that, that, that I don't believe in government and I'm running for office because I don't believe in government. Now, I know that doesn't make any sense, but if you say it enough times, you'll believe it. <laughs> so, Citizens United is an assault on our democracy. And this is what we're up against. This is the real, we were talking about risks before and risks by standing up to Wall Street. I think not. Risks is letting our democracy fall because of corporate control, because of corporate millions that are being thrown into our elected to, to pollute our, our democracy. We in Richmond have shown that we can de define our own destiny. We have done this time and time again. We've reversed the, the downward spiral. We're rising up. We're rising out of a history of scarcity and despair. We're showing that we're no longer a city that's defined by, um, by high crime. We do this by defining our own destiny. Chevron would like us to let them define our destiny. And we can't let them do that. This is a true uh, situation of us determining our own future. So thank you all for giving that great thought. I'm a lawyer, and Citizens United will go down as one of the worst decisions ever penned by the courts. Like Dred Scott, like the Korematsu decision, it'll go down as one that was not well reasoned or well thought out. And I am sad that I've seen a large influence of money impacting the city, because I actually went out and raised my own money and haven't even had an ability to spend it because one day I got 10 pieces of mail in my mailbox. But at the same time, I also am sad in that it seems like this is the culture. You know, I have this, we're starting to see in the school this week, charter school money starting to spend a lot. But it, it's sad, and I've spoken out and denounced it, but then I get attacked by the very people who criticize being attacked. I got called names. I was told I was bad. And I think it just has to be where people have to understand it's not that important and we need to treat each other with civility and respect. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what food access or food justice initiatives are you currently involved in, given that obesity and food access are huge problems in our community? And we'll start with Javak. And we'll start with Javak Beckham. What's, what uh, food justice initiative. initiative have I personally been involved in? Oh, been involved in? Um, well, there's, um, you know, it, with, with regard to just being involved, I think that one of the things that encourages more action from, from the community is when uh, those elected to represent them support their ideas, because we don't always have all of them all of the answers, but we don't have, or do we have all the ideas? But there are lots of community organizations that have so many ideas, Happy Lot, uh, Urban Till, um, you know, the Peace Garden. Like, there are lots of organizations in Richmond that I support because I believe that, you know, we, we don't have to, uh, we don't have to be hungry, we can grow our own food, um, you know, we, we don't have, we can grow locally, we can buy locally, we can support, you know, those gardens. There's a wonderful garden at Adam Crest. You know, they sell their products at Catapula. You know, are we there buying it? We have local gardeners who, who uh, sell their products at our farmer's market. And, those, and, I, and that's where I buy, I buy my products locally because I believe that it's Hi. important that we have. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, what uh, sort of food justice or food access uh, initiatives are you currently involved in given that uh, our community has high rates of obesity and food access uh, issues? I'm currently not involved in any uh, uh, food justice movements. However, I did um, support um, the soda tax. I thought that was a great idea. Um, I've often um, uh, made connections with uh, organizations like Urban Till. I shop at, when they set up their kiosks and stuff at uh, Catahoula Coffee, I, I spend my money there. I shop at the farmer's market. Uh, in fact, every Wednesday at Rubicon, we have a uh, mobile 
uh, fresh produce truck. So every Wednesday I'm out there, I purchase my food and vegetables there. And beside, and also I like vegetables with uh, seeds. So, you know, I'm like, you know, Masanto, all, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's like, man, what's going on? So, yeah, I, you know. You know, I'm, from, I'm, I'm a kid from the hood, right? So, you know, all this innovation, all the things that's taking place in the city of Richmond, my, my goal is to make people I grew up with susceptible to this and open to these changes. And so, that's my answer. Thank you for that question. Um, I was also a point for uh, the sugary uh, softening tax. Um, but just in general, uh, good health and, and good food, it's just the common sense to do. But once again, it's the communication effort. A lot of the school children, uh, even though the tax or even the billboards were inundated with diabetes or asthma or different food groups uh, trying to process different to process foods, uh, they weren't educated. It was up there, we voted on it, but the children were not educated. They need to be educated, they need to be shown the difference. Um, I was so happy to see a lot of the schools that did away with uh, soda drinks and started incorporating uh, water, mineral water, or other things to uh, defy the, the sugar in the water. That was a great thing. We started moving it more. Now it's almost mandated. So moving in the right direction, I'm glad that Richmond is a uh, strong proponent of that, and we need to continue on that thing. I do think that education is a prime uh, example, our prime need in terms of uh, moving our city into a healthy eating. Uh, I have worked with self-sustaining communities, uh, bringing in trees from uh, nurseries and giving them out to low-income neighborhoods. We've given over 18,000 trees. We've donated some to Urban Tilt, and Urban Tilt has been doing a fantastic job of educating <coughs> young people in urban farming. So education is very, very important. Um, and I think that urban farms are also great educational centers for teaching people how to uh, work with livestock, how to do beekeeping. Um, but I also think that the soda tax is a good thing. And when Jim Rogers was talking about the billboards that he had, you know, that kept uh, alcohol and cigarette uh, billboards from advertising near schools, uh, the one poison he didn't consider, and I asked him to, was to not advertise sugared drinks near schools. So first of all, urban agriculture is really taken off in the city of Richmond, and we do owe Urban Till a great, great thank, thank you for making that happen. Um, our Greenway is just an incredible, magical place with beautiful produce growing, healthy produce, and beautiful artwork to surround it as well. Um, I am very proud that after the Urban Agriculture Summit that was, I think, in 2009, um, we wanted to do some follow-up, and I met with uh, Dory Robinson and um, others, and we uh, decided, with Doria's um, suggestion, I believe, to create a Food Policy Council, which Doria took under her own wing and made uh, to happen on a regular basis. And now we've talked about, and I do want to see this happen, a food policy ordinance that has some initiatives so that we can get more food, healthy food in our grocery stores and many other distribution of healthy food. So um, I think we're doing great. We need to keep doing. We have to end the food deserts with healthy, healthy food. I was actually one of the signers on the ballot initiative for the soda tax, so I was a person who took the lead with Juan Reardon to promote that because I believe, one, being diabetic for the last 16 years, that we have to be more educated about choices that we make as well as exercise. And so I've worked hard to make sure that we're building a new swim center over at the Kennedy site that's going on right now we will be utilized not just by seniors but by youth and other people because I think diet and exercise are critical and key. And one thing I want to be able to do is give some incentive to businesses who come and promote healthy lifestyles and do work around education to make sure that they do things in restaurants and dining are, are giving uh, opportunities 
to brakes, and then continue the uh, pedestrian work with the food, I mean, not food, but the, the, bike, the bike pedestrian ways to be able to encourage walking and bicycling. I think that's gonna be pivotal, because I walk all around the city of Richmond now as part of my exercise routine, because I think it's necessary to keep good health. Thank you. So we are at time, but I would add, like to ask the audience and the candidates to stay for closing remarks. And we, um, if that's okay with everyone, we're going to start. And you have 60 seconds, so one minute. We're going to start with Damian King. Closing remarks. So um, I was just going to project my voice. <laughs> so, um, so again, um, I'm a lifelong Richmond resident. I believe I'm the only candidate since the 72 to run from the Iron Triangle. And I think that when a lot of people think about crime and violence, it happens in that area, in those neighborhoods. And I just want to be a catalyst to help, again, demystify this whole process, particularly for young kids and young adults of color, and uh, to let them know that, hey, if I can make a transition, if I can make a change in my life, because see, I'm one of those individuals that that uh, often tell young people, if you can buy dope at wholesale and sell it at retail, that's a transferable skill. I want to be that very, I want to be that buffer, I want to be that liaison who can help communicate some of the changes, some of the beautiful things that are taking place in Richmond, because I want to ensure that every individual who is currently here, who believes that Richmond is home, who wants to call Richmond their home, see themselves as a stakeholder. I don't want to leave anybody behind. I believe it's important that every resident here in the city of Richmond sees themselves as a stakeholder. Definitely got marketing skills. Uh, once again, to Ethan for uh, hosting this wonderful event. Uh, to my colleagues, to the candidates that are up here, for wanting to make a difference, uh, I applaud them wholeheartedly um, for their passion. And certainly, uh, I bring passion. I bring leadership. I want to be your voice, not for one people, but for all people, for all Richmond moving forward. Uh, not for just a single group, not for a single neighborhood, even though I've been in every neighborhood. And I, I've talked to many of you, but we need to move forward in a positive way, in a constructive way, in a healthy way, uh, to make Richmond even better. We talked about how good it is now. Yes, it is. But we need to move better. We need to move ahead, stronger, bring those up that are behind us to where we are and where we need to be. Vote, please vote for Al Martinez on November the 4th. Thank you so much. I believe I heard you say Ed Martinez. <laughs> so, so uh, please, more than one, more than one. So, so please, please vote for me. Uh, uh, because uh, as a school teacher, I've taught for 18 years. I've worked with six, uh, seven, I mean, uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. I also worked with uh, county core school, which means that I helped set up the seventh, eighth grade class for truants pre-expulsion, kids just out of duty hall and not ready to go back into the regular classroom. So I know how to work with all kinds of kids and working with kids, uh, I look out here and I actually see grown up kids. So I know how to work with you also. <laughs> so uh, uh, Richmond is a fantastic place. Uh, I go to all the neighborhoods and I feel welcomed in all the neighborhoods uh, because I am a people person, and it's you that I care about and want to work for. Thank you. I want to close by saying once again, we've come too far to turn back now. We have truly reversed that downward, that downward spiral, and we cannot risk stagnated, stagnating or going back downward. We have to keep rising, and I am so, so proud to have been a part of Richmond's transformation thus far, and I'm deeply, deeply committed to continue that transformation, rising together from our history of, of scarcity and despair. Um, I'm very proud to be running as a council candidate with Eduardo Martinez and Jovanka Beckles as part of Team Richmond. We are facing, as you know, some really powerful special interests, some really powerful moneyed interests. But we are standing tall with community because we know that is how our future and the future of generations to come will be assured. So with your vote, we will continue this transformation and I look forward to being on your council still.
Yeah, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. It's really uplifting to see a large audience and really see citizens committed and connected to the governance process. So I just want to all say uh, thank you for coming tonight. I also want to thank all the candidates. Uh, we're winding down. We just have a couple of weeks left, and I think you've all done an excellent job and stood some of these withering attacks and some of the some of the other assaults that have taken place. And hopefully we can see a better day in Richmond. And I pledge, whether I'm elected or not, to continue to be part of what I call a positive conversation because I care deeply about this city. As many people know, I've been on the school board the last 21 years and have helped write that ship. I want to be able to do the same here on the local government side with Richmond. And with your vote and your help, I believe I can do that. And I want you to be part of Team Richmond, Team Ramsey, and team go forward, because I think that's what matters, is that we all want to do better. Whether or not people say or not, I think we're all here for the right reason. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, Richmond has become the most progressive city in the Bay Area, and quite possibly one of the most progressive cities in the United States. Everyone, everyone throughout the nation is watching to see what happens this November to see if we're going to stand up about uh, against three million dollars of corporate interest who wants to take over our government. We have the opportunity to say no. This is our government, and and we will handle our own business. Thank you very much. That's what we're going to do. So I ask for your vote. I am running, as the mayor said, as a part of a team. Myself, Eduardo, and Gail, because we are the team that's all about Richmond. That's why we call ourselves Team Richmond. We have stood up for LGBT people. We have stood up for working people. We have stood up for poor people. We have stood up for immigrants. We have stood up for people who are coming back from incarceration. Uh, we are endorsed by the San Francisco Bay View, and this is what it says. It's time to claim our political and economic power. Richmond lead the Bay Area. Well, check out the, the paper. Time, thank you. So that concludes our program this evening. Please help me thank all of the candidates. Also, thank you to all of our co-sponsors, ACNA, Cisco, CBE, SCIE, and Urban Tilt. Thank you, audience, for staying. We hope you're able to find some value in this evening's conversation with the candidates. And please, do take action moving forward. Thank you. And for the candidates, if I can get you to gather for a picture really quick, please. We've accomplished together so very much. We've come so far, and we are not turning back. We have reduced homicides 66%, property crimes are down. We have um, held Chevron accountable in terms of having them pay more taxes to the city, and now we're holding them accountable to build the safest, cleanest refinery it possibly can. We've renovated our parks, we've uh, become a leader in solar installed per person, and now we have to make more stronger and livable communities by fixing our streets and helping our struggling homeowners avoid foreclosure. We're gonna do all this, we're gonna do it together, and we're gonna do it by standing up to that multi-million multi dollar oil giant who's trying to assault our democracy. Good evening everyone and thank you for being here. It's a great turnout and pleased to see such an active crowd. My name is Charles Ramsey, I currently serve as your school board president of West Coast Trust Unified School District and have for the last 21 years. And I've been here in Richmond pretty much my whole life. And now I currently live in the Iron Triangle. And so I get to see a lot of different individuals and their struggles in their life and trying to make things happen. And so I want to be able to give back and do more, not just on the education side, but now on the local government side. And I feel really optimistic that I can build on what's been taking place and what's going on. I believe the issues around Dr. Medical Center, making sure that that becomes even more prominent amongst the conversation that we have. Looking at a deficit here, I got help get the district out of bankruptcy, and I look forward to seeing me, like Damian and Javon said, a minute's not a long time, so we'll be able to get into your questions a bit a little bit. Thank you for having me.
I'm Jim Rogers. I want to uh, thank everybody for coming out. I'm an incumbent council member running for re-election. Uh, I think Mayor McLaughlin hit it on the head. Things have gotten better in Richmond. Why is that? Well, it's because we have people who are part of an independent, progressive majority. There's five of us, and look at the record. We stood up to Chevron. We got the best conditions of any refining permit in the U.S. We got $90 million. Could have been better. Yeah, could have been better. And I, and I respect some people who felt they needed to abstain because they wanted to push a little extra. But this was something that George Miller was calling me up to lobby me about. Never talked to me before. And he was against it the last time. I was against it. Tom Butt, Henry Clark, etc. So this shows what happens when you have independence and when you can push. We've done a lot of good things. We took a shot at the soda tax. It didn't work, but it's working now in Mexico, and it'll probably get passed in San Francisco and Berkeley. Uh, we have campaign finance reform, public financing. We've done a lot of good progressive things, and I want to have the chance to keep us going forward for the next four years. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Henry Washington. I want to thank APAN and all the co-hosts and all of the candidates for being here. This is a lovely turnout. I'm a native of Richmond, was born here in 1967. I was educated here. I pastor a church here in Richmond, California. I um, became interested in politics about five or six years ago when I found out that Richmond was one of the fourth worst places to live in the United States. And it was largely around crime, uh, homicides, and public safety in general. Since that time, I not only was traumatized by it, but I began to work. And from that time, I've worked with various ecumenical societies, law enforcement, and the person of, in the persons of RPD, Sheriff's Department, parole, probation, to bridge the gap between government or policy makers and the people. I desire your support to be on the city council. Great, thank you candidates. Um, so before we begin again uh, with the questions, I'm going to ask the audience if you guys can refrain from applauding as well as making any remarks. We want to be able to respect everyone here, their opinion, and also time, right? We all want to get out of here on time, got things to, things and people to go home to, so let's kind of um, hold off on all of that. And I'm going to um, re-ask the first question. Um, it is, as Richmond residents deserve to breathe clean air, yet we suffer from high rates of asthma, cancer, and other adverse health conditions from industrial polluters that poison our communities. We face additional safety concerns from explosions at the Chevron refinery and trains that are transporting volatile crude oil. How would you hold polluters accountable from, for, for exposing our neighborhoods to these types of hazards? Thank you so much. Um, as Javaga stated earlier, I have absolutely no intentions to take um, any money from a corporation like Chevron, but also I think the part of the, uh, the solution is education. I think it's extremely important for uh, leadership to make it a point to also not only res represent U.S. citizens, but also labor to educate you. And I think that in order to hold uh, big corporations like Chevron or polluters accountable, you have to be able to mobilize educated, well-informed people. And if I'm getting information coming down the pike, things that are may not necessarily be available to you as citizens, it's my responsibility to provide you with information and insight and perspective that hopefully you can make a pragmatic decision to join in in defending or advocating for what it is that you want and you desire as a community. I think a lot of people have are on the fence when it comes to corporations like Chevron because they provide jobs and opportunities, they invest in the community, but then on the other side, I grew up with asthma in this community. And uh, my mom used to put a nail in the tree and she, would, uh, she used to think that when I outgrew the nail, then I would outgrow my asthma. But at that time, she wasn't uh, you know, informed about Chevron and pollution and those things. And my mother has gone on since then, but had she had been educated, I definitely believe she would have been involved with advocating for what was right for this community with regards to our health and pollution in our air. Thank you so much. Thank you. Al Martinez. Thank you, that's a wonderful question. Um, as an executive leader, uh, we had many uh, issues to not only address, 
but to hold people accountable with. The question that's posed is how would I hold them accountable? Uh, simply put it, you would have a meeting. We know what the people want, the people of Richmond. If it's addressed in the question, we know what we want. We have to get in the boardroom uh, with Chevron. Find out what their underlines are. Whoever it is, Chevron, any organization. Find out what they're at, where they're at, where they're going, and what significance they pose. We have to, as the previous had mentioned, we have to communicate that back to the community. We can't leave the community in the dark. But most importantly, and most emphatically, is that the organization has to know where we stand. Organizations don't move, the people move organizations. So we, as a people, as a community, have to be very informative of where we go with this. So it's any business, any organization, you hold them accountable by somebody that's been there. You don't let it relinquish because I am your voice. I'm your champion. So I have to speak on behalf of the Richmond community. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, it is the people that moves the city forward. Um, uh, we know that there is a vacuum crew that's being unloaded at the Kinder Morgan yard. We know that uh, Chevron wants to process heavier, dirtier crew. We also know that there's uh, pet coke and, and, and coal being driven through our neighborhoods without any covering so that when they go through the neighborhoods, all that dust goes through. Just today, I talked to someone who lives in, in the Santa Fe area and said that uh, their fans were being clogged by uh, coal dust. And so he went to the yard there and they said, it's not us, but we know who it is. And, and we need to hold them accountable. As your council member, I would push to make sure that those trucks that are unloading at Kinder Morgan and going through our neighborhood do not go through our neighborhood because we need to protect our highways, we need to protect our citizens, and we need to hold them accountable. It's not profits before our health. It's not profits before our lives. So we need to protect ourselves by becoming active. And I really want to thank all of you for being there and for standing up to the corporations that are trying to harm us for profit. Thank you. It's, it's clear that the way we hold these polluters accountable is by strictly and verifiably regulating them. And I know you all know this because so many of you for year after year after year have mobilized saying to Chevron, our health is not for sale, saying that we want the regulated refinery that we deserve so that our health is protected, so that our safety is assured. And it's because of your multi-year mobilization that we got a better project with some strict conditions. Some of us wanted even stronger conditions and we're still fighting for that. We also deserve a very, very safe refinery so that children are not pulled out of the playground into homes to shelter in place because of major incidents like happened with the 2012 explosion. And that was not the first incident. Chevron has had a history of many, many incidents. And that is why the city of Richmond is suing them. And that is another way we hold them accountable, by not settling for uh, you know, just some weak settlement. We need council members, we need a mayor that'll stand strong on this lawsuit issue and not settle for peanuts. We deserve a strong, large settlement because of the damage that we incurred as a community and a city. And we also deserve um, the kind of repairs full repairs in the refinery. So, and that requires that Chevron puts the health of our community before its corporate profits. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think this is an excellent question and one that I have a long track record of advocating and doing more. We've been demolishing and rebuilding all of our schools, getting rid of all the pollutants and working with DTSC. The, the Division of Toxic Substances and Control to make sure we clean up this community and do what we can because we think we want to make sure we were doing our part. I think with Urban Tilt, what they're doing and making sure that we clean up the neighborhoods, as well as what Gail says, keeping all the corporations working with Cal OSHA, making sure that regulations and having more enforcement to make sure that some of the issues that we've seen in terms of 
the explosion that took place in 2012, fortunately nobody died, but that was a big major problem. I was right around the corner when that happened down in Atchison Village, when that took place. So I think there's a lot we can do, a lot we can do. And Andres, you know you came to the school board meeting, you asked me to put be put on the agenda to be able to continue to have the communication. I did that. And so we were having the conversation and being able to educate and include individuals around making sure that we reduce the amount of greenhouse gases, that we reduce the amount of other pollutants that we have in the air, and that we ensure that all of our communities have clean air and clean water. It's really critical that we do that, and I've been a true advocate and, 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 and believer in that. Everybody here is gonna say, we wanna hold Chevron accountable, say there's problems with Chevron. What you've got to figure out is not who has good intentions, because I think we all do. You've got to figure out who's going to get the job done. I'm the person who spearheaded the utility tax in 2004. Seven million a year, most of it paid by Chevron. When Chevron settled for $150 million on our tax dispute, one of the reasons they did is because I had filed a ballot initiative, raised about $40,000 for it, and it was going to cost Chevron about three or four million dollars a year. That wasn't the only reason. There's a lot of other reasons, but that's one. Our industrial safety ordinance. We tripled the county health inspectors, moved the standard to as low of a risk as reasonably possible. Again, I brought that to the council. It isn't enough to have good intentions. You have to understand how things work, be able to get in there, work with your colleagues, and get it done. The agreement we negotiated with Chevron, you know, maybe Mayor Rebecca's right, maybe we could have gotten a little more, but look at it, $90 million in community benefits. We're having this big debate about Doctors Medical Center. Guess what, without all that money we negotiated, we wouldn't be having that debate. We don't have any money in the general fund to think about paying the doctor's hospital. We might possibly, possibly be able to actually save that particular facility. If we don't, we spend on wonderful programs like um, internet access for fence line communities, Richmond Promise, things like that. So. Look not just at who wants to hold Chevron accountable, accountable. look who has the record of actually getting it done on the ground, and that's important. Excuse me, can you take your feet off the wall, please? I think the only way to hold Chevron or any leader of industry that's a gross polluter accountable is through legislation. Through this latest Alternative 11, uh, we have some wins, um, some victories, and we still have some ways to go. We have uh, Chevron to commit to over $8 million a year towards um, advancements in reducing greenhouse. They're changing all of their piping. Um, we got them to go from 900, long, 900 million long tons of sulfur um, through the city down to 750. And there's some things that we lost as well, like um, arsenic, uh, excuse me, arsenic and sulfur oxide uh, contaminant um, are going to go up uh, during the modernization program. But I think our real challenge is to work together as a city. You cannot receive over $35 million a year um, from a company and then treat them as your enemy. Without Chevron, our budget suffers greatly. We have to work with Chevron. We have um, EPA, we have BAA, um, QMD, we have um, in, uh, the CBE. We have a lot of um, legislative bodies that uh, we need to work together. But we need to find a goal that we want from Chevron and then stand, not treat them as an enemy. Thank you. And Javanka, would you like to answer the first question? Are you okay? Okay, great. So we'll move on to question number two, and we'll start with Al Martinez. The question is, do you support keeping Dr. Medical Center open as a full service hospital, and if necessary, integrating it into Contra Costa Health Services? If so, what specifically will you do to push for needed funding and to hold the Contra Costa Board of Supervisors accountable to ensure the hospital remains open? Thank you for that question. Uh, yes, I do. Um, but it's not all Richmond. Uh, if uh, Doctors Medical Hospital is to remain open, we can be a strong component. We can be an advocate, but the county has to do their part 
Pinole has to do their part, El Cerrito, all the county um, municipalities have to do their part. Always when somebody gets in trouble, they always look to Big Brother. They always look to Richmond. That's fine that we're looked at in that way, but come on now, everybody has to be accountable. We talk about accountability like it's a loose word. It, it involves integrity, it involves stepping up to the plate. Everybody wants a part of that gym, but nobody wants to pay for it except Richmond. We can't be held totally responsible for that. We can be the advocate, we can be the champion, but we need to hold Pinole, Hercules, Rodeo, El Cerrito, and the county so they can help uh, budget this as well. But yes, I'm uh, uh, totally agreeable to holding that open as a full-time hospital. Thank you. Eduardo Martinez. Um, yes, uh, last night at the city council meeting, I proposed that uh, Doctors Medical Center become part of the county system. And by becoming part of the county system, the county could impose a utility tax on the refineries that are in the unincorporated parts of the county. That way, all the money could go into the, uh, in, into the county to uh, keep the hospitals open and doctor's hospital would receive an equal amount from that. That would be a way to keep from adding property taxes to, to West County. Um, the hospital has to stay open. It needs to be a full service center. Um, and uh, we need to uh, make sure that it provides all of our needs. Uh, a community without a hospital is not a community. You cannot run a city without a hospital. It'd be like running a city without a police station or running the city without schools. It is an essential part of the community, so it must be open and it must be available to all citizens. So also by becoming part of the county system, it needs to uh, reach out and uh, develop relationships with universities and other hospitals. So uh, it, can, it is doable, but uh, we need money immediately and I propose that we have a symposium in which all of the cities come together along with the hospitals and come up with that money. I fully, fully support uh, Doctors Hospital staying open as a full service hospital with acute services and an emergency room for our community. Every community, as was stated, needs a hospital, a public hospital, to take care of its public health needs. Um, last night at the City Council meeting, we uh, had a staff report that I asked staff to come back with uh, from the previous meeting, and we were moved one step closer to keeping Doctors Hospital open as a full service hospital last night. By way of this plan, it requires many partners to come together, including the county, including uh, some money from the Chevron um, proposal, the Chevron benefit agreement, including other cities to at least get behind this plan, including other refineries, including other hospitals. This is how we, we are going to save the hospital. And it also includes mobilization of the community. And I want to thank CNA, the California Nurses Association, for leading the charge on this. They mobilized for over and over again, long before this came to the city council meeting, um, long before the, um, the Chevron project came, when many of us were trying to get money for DMC uh, in that benefit agreement. So just like with Chevron, Mobilization makes things change. Mobilization will bring this hospital into fruition as a full service hospital to serve the needs of our community. Yeah, I uh, think that I want to really emphasize the human rights issue. We need to make sure that we have this hospital open. I, I'm a school board, I serve children. There's a lot of uninsured kids who need that facility. I think Eduardo summed it up really well in his comment about really being active and involved. I work with the city council. I want to thank Gail. I want to, I want to thank Jim and, and the courtier because they kept our schools open. So I've seen the impact if we had closed schools of Kennedy, Grant, Olinda, just the overall impact. So I know what kind of uh, devastation it will cause to this community. I'm a person who deals with diabetes every day. And so I know the importance 
of staying healthy and having at resources. My mother, who since passed away, didn't even talk about it, I lost my mom four years ago to cancer. She got taken over to a doctor's medical center one time because she needed some service and help when she had an acute injury and she had to go directly there. And she had insurance, but she went to DMC. So I think that it would be devastating to be in that situation. But I also call upon the council to look at the other regional groups in this community. Don't give Panola a pass. Don't give Hercules a pass. Don't give the county a pass. Make sure they understand the consequences and the impacts to everybody. Thank you. I think we all, I think pretty much everybody in the room agrees we want DMC open. We want it open as a full service hospital. We don't want some separate uh, second rate scaled down thing. But again, the question is, who has the record of putting together those kinds of coalitions and getting it done? We have two taxes that are getting money for the city of Richmond. There's been about 10 unsuccessful efforts. I spearheaded both of those. What they have in common, they raise about 15 million a year. What they have in common is that they're generally paid for by people who are out of town, people who are rich, or large companies like Chevron. I am now spearheading the Yes on You campaign raising the money, wrote the ballot argument, and hopefully we'll be able to pass it. We can fix potholes, money for police, parks, libraries, and most of the money, again, is paid for by people who are either out-of-town folks or business folks. So when we're putting this plan together, number one, we have to be realistic. This is a tough, tough fight, okay? We need to understand how you go out, work with other people, work on the taxes, we need to be honest about it. There's not some rich uncle that's going to give us a bunch of money, okay? This is hard stuff. You have the county to put in the money, and there's probably, very likely, going to have to be a hard decision about making a tax. And I'm good with that, and I will work on that. That is part of the plan, and it probably has to be part of the plan. It has to be a parcel tax if we're really going to keep DMC open. So let's be honest about it. Let's put our shoulders together. Let's get to work on it. As I address this question, what I really want to address is we as a city and city leadership have to stop waiting until the last minute to react to catastrophes like the Richmond Housing Association, Doctors Medical Center, and so on. We all know we need a local hospital. Kaiser is geared to do what Kaiser does, especially for their membership. The new county facility is geared to do what they do best. What we need to do is find out which entity or which hospital, which um, can do a better job and can be more, um, what makes more fiscal sense. Um, now that we understand that um, DMC has been operating at an $18 million per year deficit, and now that Governor Brown has given the nod for $3 million, and our incumbent um, council people have um, moved that we use $15 million of the $90 million money from Chevron to go towards DMC. We need to think about their proposals to build a new hospital. Maybe they need to be just an emergency, a room for now, something they do well, and take zone one emergencies, um, um, zone one emergencies well. But they've got plans to build a 100 bed hospital and if we think about it, it costs about a million and some change to, uh, per bed to build that. And towards the future, this could be jobs. We've got to think about tomorrow and stop reacting to catastrophes. It's not working. Would you please repeat the question? Yes. Do you support keeping Dr. Medical Center open as a full service hospital and if necessary, integrating it into Contra Costa Health Services? If so, what specifically will you do to push for needing, needed funding and to hold the Contra Costa Board of Supervisors accountable to ensure the hospital remains open? All right, so I absolutely wholeheartedly believe that we have to have um, a full service hospital. I don't believe having an emergency is, uh, hospital in, in our county is enough, particularly when we have a time bomb ticking, right? Because there are lots of uh, machinery at the Chevron refinery that we know needs to be upgraded last year. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of time, unless of course we can get some accountability from um, But I work for the county, and I work in health services, and I absolutely believe that 
this is a county, this, this hospital should be a part of the county system. And I intend to, uh, to, to work with the uh, CNAs and, and mobilize with you all. And, and I say we, you know, we go down to the Board of Supervisors meeting and we let our voices be heard that, and demand that we uh, have a full service hospital. Now, there are some of us, you know, I've been on so many of these candidates forums and some people are really good you know, with rhetoric. They are able to persuade you with what they're saying only. But look at what they've been doing. Have you seen them walking the picket line with the nurses? Have you seen them do it more than once? Have you seen them communicating with the very people who are working to save the lives of West County uh, uh, residents? Have you seen them in the community taking a stand? That's what you gotta remember. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. Um, I absolutely support um, EMC remaining open. However, we have to be real, realistic. I was born there, my mother passed away there. And um, I think one of the things that's important is that, you know, we've been having this issue since 2005. And I think that if we just keep the doors open, what's the long-term plan? I mean, we might be able to save the hospital for a couple of months, but what's the long-term plan? And so those are the kind of things that I'm concerned about. And I'm not gonna pretend, you know, I'm not gonna be a politician and pretend that I know all the facts and I have all the information. That's why I believe it's important for uh, community leaders to make it a point to inform you all. Uh, because again, these are one of those things that during this election season, this has become a very dominant issue at all forums and part of the conversation. But my thing is, how long have our leader, had our leadership known about this issue? How long have we been, um, uh, how long has this information been held back from us, the common citizens? And so those are the things that I'm concerned about. Again, this has been taking place, uh, Doctors Medical had an issue beginning in 2005, and so here we are, 2014, and we're back at the same issue. So again, we need to think about leadership who is going to inform us so that we can hear from the people. I don't have all the answers. I can't make a decision for everyone in here. I'm just a voice, and I'm just an individual who would advocate on what it is that you desire. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to move to the third question, and we'll be starting with Eduardo Martinez. While there has been significant progress over the past four years, Richmond still suffers from high unemployment. At the same time, renewable energy is one of the fastest growing industries in California. What is your plan to decrease unemployment generally, and specifically, how would you bring green jobs to Richmond? Well, um, the unemployment problem just isn't a problem here in Richmond. It's a problem nationwide. And uh, as Bernie Sanders said when he was here, uh, what we need to do is to cut the budget on military spending and do it on public works. So I know that's something that isn't starting at the local level, but we as citizens and as uh, local entities need to push for that to happen. And we can start it here by uh, holding Chevron accountable and having Chevron start their own upgrade program. They've agreed to redo 20%, but there's 80% that they're not renewing, that needs to be renewed. We need to push them to do that. They have 29 tanks. They agreed to, talk, to put a dome on three of them to meet the uh, level of, of uh, 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 zero net increase. Well, all of those domes need to be domed. All, all of those tanks need to be domed. So we need uh, to also increase our uh, solar use. And uh, uh, I would propose that we continue with the solar program that we have and actually push it even more. Um, so there are lots of things that we can do, and um, we'll do them. Thank you. Richmond has never been better positioned for a truly diverse economy. Um, we are in a position where we do not and should not be dependent on one domineering business, one domineering oil giant. We have to continue our diversity of business development. Um, and how do we do this? 
quality of life improvements are known to bring in new businesses. So that's what we're doing, new park renovations. We're reducing our crime. We have to keep doing that. Um, we can have a state-of-the-art website that like a one-stop for businesses that are looking to come into Richmond, saying what wonderful amenities we have, uh, showcasing what real estate we have, showcasing um, you know, what uh, business opportunities are here in the city. So this is, this is the kind of marketing for new business, diverse uh, businesses that we need to do in Richmond. What have I done so far in terms of green job development? I think everyone knows that that has been a real strong passion of mine. The green job training program that we have through Richmond Built would not have gotten all the awards if we didn't have the solar installation training program, the HAZMAT training program. Um, now we've had so many of our Richmond residents that have graduated from this program and it's helped us become number one in the Bay Area for solar installed per capita because our graduates have graduated in solar installation and have put those uh, solar panels on rooftops. Thank you. Yeah, Gail took the words out of my mouth. I mean, working with Richmond Builds, working with the solar programs, I think are gonna be critical. I have a track record of being able to do this. In the school district, we're doing major renovations, all building new schools all throughout the city and providing hundreds of good union wage paid jobs every single day and they're supporting the businesses around them here. But I think another comment that was made that I think is that is the quality of life continuing the reduction of homicide, being able to make sure we have active engaged parks and continuing to promote what we do on the short line. I think that's gonna bring families and help drive other economies here, which will help reduce the job training is going to also be a pivotal part of what we can do as a city and be able to help the families that are here and give them new opportunities, as she said, with the solar panel installation and to be able to do other support services like that. I think as long as we champion that, we can make a big, big difference. But I also believe we need to do something to reduce the problems that we have with our county assessor and looking at what we can do to not have the aggressive Prop 8 reductions that have taken place in this community and deprive the city of needed and necessary revenue of five to six to seven million dollars, which could help be the engine that we need to really get things going. And so I think those are the, some of the techniques and strategies that I want to bring if I'm uh, able to be elected to this council. Great question. It is a really important question, and it's uh, it's both part of um, protecting us economically, moving into the new world of green jobs, and it's part of us moving against the crisis of climate change. We're in a position that we have land, we have businesses for the green businesses, we're near LVNL, near UC Berkeley, etc. So we're in a unique position to really move forward with this green agenda. We have put in more solar rooftops than anywhere else on a per capita basis in the Bay Area. And that's great, but that's not enough. Our main contributor in the Bay Area to global warming is transportation. I've gotten $15 million into the Chevron project for two programs. One is EasyGo, which is a continuation of our award-winning green car sharing program that is called Electricity. It's to try to make electric cars part of the mainstream. And if we can't deal with the transportation sector, we can't really move our greenhouse gas emissions down to where they have to be. It's not enough to deal with electricity and the solar panels, as wonderful as they are, that's not going far enough. We have to realize we have to go after all of our emission problems, starting with transportation. In the city of Richmond, the unemployment rate is just over 10%. The national average is just over 6%. In a lot of black and brown communities, unemployment rate is above 20%. As it pertains to green energy, we're on the West Coast. Let's use more solar panels. Let's put up wind mills, wind turbines, and we're, we have a 32 mile, a 32, um, mile coastline we should take advantage of the tides and the waves, the energy there. We are in a perfect position to not only be the highest solar um, uh, user or installer per capita, 
but go further. When Andrew Young was here the other day, he said something, and it stuck in my mind. He said he accidentally turned towards the West, and he was blinded. Doesn't know anywhere all over the country where we have that kind, that kind of a resource. So I think um, there are two issues here. How do we bring jobs, and how do we bring green jobs? I think that we have to think about part work, part certification when it comes to people unemployed, especially fresh graduates. Maybe we can guarantee them some monies, but push for their certification, their tenure, um, that they can get work in the future. But I think the city needs to invest in that. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, first of all, unemployment is a national issue. It's not just Richmond. But the good thing about that is that Richmond, we have been developing some very innovative, creative solutions to issues that plague the whole nation. So we've not been waiting to get uh, you know, our handout from the federal government. We've been taking uh, our, our own uh, uh, future into, into our own hands. Um, I believe that we can also we can get a lot of jobs by just um, uh, by by fixing our infrastructure first of all because that would create a lot of jobs. Um, but what I what I what I want to just emphasize to you is that we have the answers to ourselves now. Whether it's green jobs, like the kinds of jobs that Urban Till provides to our young people, uh, building gardens. Um, the same thing with troop that are building gardens. So those those are all green jobs. Those are all green jobs that our very own residents thought about. They came up with it. So we have the ingenuity to to create our, our jobs for ourselves and not just wait for somebody to hand it to us. But the the other issue is the Chevron refinery. People were saying that if we ask too much, it's going to kill jobs. And the fact is that what we want, the kinds of safety. Uh, measures that we want to put in place will create even more jobs. I believe Eduardo mentioned that earlier, and, uh, and that's, what, that's what we need to do. So I think uh, the city of Richmond is in a unique uh, position right now. I think that we are, um, we are in a position where innovation, uh, what I call urban ingenuity, is extremely critical uh, to, to, to this. I'm also a fan of uh, social entrepreneurship. I'm a hard skills development specialist with Rubicon Programs, a 40-year organization here in the community. And I deal with a lot of disenfranchised youth and young adults who aren't necessarily susceptible to all the positive changes that are taking place in the city. So one of my, one of my personal goals is, is to enlighten them about different things that are taking place in the community. One of the things I was able to do uh, in the last year or so is uh, serve as chair for the uh, Marine Clean Energy Community Leadership Advisory Group, which was a great experience for me to learn about clean energy, uh, to learn about uh, uh, the benefits of clean energy and, 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 and community choice, um, but also, again, innovation. Um, I would love to see major corporations like Chevron offer unrestricted funding to organizations like Urban Tilt, like the Rise Center, so that these organizations can build social enterprises that can generate jobs and revenue for their organizations so they don't have to rely so much on soft funding. So I think that that's an extremely uh, incredible idea that um, as, as a team, if I was a member of the council, that I would definitely advocate for. So more social enterprise, more cooperatives, uh, so that people can actually possess the power and generate the kind of revenue and live the lifestyles that are uh, that that is conducive to their personal belief system and and have jobs that are that are uh, unique to their personal belief system. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, very good question. And I see the the opportunity there for Richmond. However. What I see what's going on is a systemic situation, a systemic problem here in Richmond. I think we have the wherewithal with the folks here in Richmond, but they're taking their goods, their ingenuity, their work ethics outside of Richmond and working. Why is that? Why are they going elsewhere to work? And they live here in Richmond. So we have what it takes here. So it's systemic. It's communication. It's application. I know when I was the postmaster here in Richmond, right down the street, and we were hiring casuals at $19 an hour. I didn't wait for Oakland or headquarters to put on a forum. I did it. 
right here at St. Mark's Church. We had 400 people come in, mostly Latino. And I showed them an easier way to take the job. A simpler way that they wanted. But they showed me one thing. They had a mind to work. And they wanted to stay here and work. And we hired several hundreds of those folks. And they stayed here. They stayed in the community. So if it has to be, let it be me. Get out there and show them the way. Sometimes they don't know that we have jobs here. Yes, we got to communicate and educate our organization that we have the people here. And like so many of them said, we have the luxury of wonderful people here that want to do a job. But they don't know the availability of the resource ability here. We need to show them that. We need to take them there. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll be moving to the fourth question and we'll start with Gail McLaughlin. Currently a petition is being circulated that would increase Richmond's minimum wage and allow for five paid sick days annually. If enough signatures are gathered for this petition, would you vote to enact the legislation or would you vote to place it on the ballot before voters? I absolutely would support uh, a petition with uh, signatures that is being currently circulated um, to increase the minimum wage even faster than we have it by way of the ordinance that the city council currently um, uh, enacted in our city. And yes, of course, sick days are something that, that people have a right to. Our country, in fact, is way behind other countries of the world um, in terms of the benefits that workers are um, allot allotted. What we have now, and uh, myself and the um, vice mayor um, brought forward a resolution, an ordinance to increase our minimum wage. So by 2018, we'll be at $13 an hour. It's a phased in approach. Now, I think we could go up faster. I wanted to go up, and I think um, many, uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Joe Monica Beckles, wanted to go up faster, like to $15 an hour. We still have 16%, actually it's between 16 and 18% poverty in the city of Richmond. People deserve um, a living wage, really. So I would certainly um, support a, um, some kind of a legislation by the city council to go up faster to $15 to a living wage and to uh, institute sick days for um, workers in the city of Richmond. Um, our community deserves that. You know, the wealth inequality in our society is growing. And we have to look at that if we're going to be justice advocates, which I certainly know that all of you and um, I support uh, that particular perspective as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm on board with this, and I, with, I don't think it needs to even be put on the ballot. I think we can implement it by putting it on as a council and making sure it happens. Also, not just that, but sick days obviously are important, but flex time, giving working families more opportunity to be able to do that. I have people that work with me, their mothers, they spend time with their kids. I give them flex time because I know they're going to work hard and get it done. So we have to think outside the box and not be so a rigid about the traditional work hours and the work day. And we have to try to find solutions to that. I think it's critical. People are working harder and harder and harder and getting less. And we see the wealth divide just expanding and growing and growing. And we need to we need to change that. I come out of a community that's been proud. African Americans have suffered because of this for, for a very long time. My mother worked at EDD when it was here at the Richmond office. For, uh, for 30 years at that office, and I saw her never make more than $32,000 a year and try to raise five children, which she did, and all five of us graduated from college. So I think that that is something that I'm very, very much aware of and sensitive to, and I believe truly we can do a lot in working to be leaders on that, as well as seeing what San Francisco is doing around health care. We have to make sure that people receive health insurance and do that, that's going to help your community all the way around. A healthier community makes for a better community. I think uh, I was very proud that uh, Richmond became the only city in Contra Costa to actually move forward with the minimum wage law. Um, we have a strong law. I think that it's possible to be stronger. I had suggested, among other things, that we move the uh, last increase up from 12 to 13 an hour. And I want to talk about one thing I did that's been criticized. I put up a vision for manufacturers who are mobile to leave 
that their increase would be halfway between our law and the state minimum. And I want to tell you why I did that. It's because after talking to some businesses, it was clear that they weren't, in fact, either not going to expand or going to leave. And let me give you an example. Galaxy Desserts, 250 blue-collar jobs. They made it clear that if they were subject to the full minimum wage instead of the halfway measure I proposed, they were gone. So do we want to have a strong minimum wage? Yeah, we do. But we need to be strategic about it and we need to make sure that we're not going to lose businesses. And that's work that this council should do. It goes on the ballot, it's there, and it's changed forever. We could be losing thousands of jobs. We couldn't do anything about it. So move forward, yes. Increase it, yes. But do it at the council level where we can fine tune it and make sure we get it right. I don't think it's so much a question as to whether I agree, and I do. It's can we get four votes? Can we get the city council to act and move together? That's been a challenge. I think that the minimum wage increase is wonderful. But did you know it's been since like 1964, since the minimum wage was anywhere near the poverty line? Our people in Richmond, in a city like California, where there are more millionaires than anywhere else in the United States, have so many poor people. And on the subject of jobs, it is time for city government to treat our own workforce the way we expect businesses that we have relationships with now and those that are coming in to treat our citizens. We must. I thought I was being told to steal third base. <laughs> I'm an A's fan, by the way. Um, yeah, I think we need to treat our workforce better. It's got to start here so that um, they can be treated well by their employer, employers. I also want to announce now that I have to leave in about 15 minutes. I have a prior engagement. I'm so sorry. This meeting was moved from, I think, the 23rd to the 22nd, so I have a mix-up. Please forgive me. Um, would I vote to have legislation uh, or, or would, I, would I want to send it to the voter? Well, I would, uh, you know, not, not obviously, but many of you may or may not know that um, it was uh, myself, uh, Mayor, who brought the increase, uh, the issue or the topic to the city council in the first place. So I believe that that's the way to go. And I'm also not very easily intimidated because I heard that argument as well. I heard Galaxy trying to threaten us about leaving town if we, you know, if we treated you fairly, if we treated workers fairly. And, and, uh, and, and my, my response to that, not necessarily to them, but my response to that you will hear is then maybe they need to go because maybe then we'll have room for employers who want to pay workers and do the right thing by workers. That's the way I look at it. So, um, you know, that, that's how I operate. I really believe in, in, in working people getting paid fairly. What would be better, of course, is a living wage. You know, because billionaires, I don't understand how much more money do they need, right? How much more money do they need to be happy? And it seems like they just want to keep making more money and keep taking away from us. They make enough money. Every last, most of these businesses, I'm talking mostly corporations that we have here, make enough money to pay people fairly. And so I believe that, um, you know, I would work as, as hard as we need to in order to bring some equity to working people. Thank you so much. So I grew up in a neighborhood, Fifth and Ripley, Harbor Way, that area. And in my neighborhood, we have a saying. Life is better when you have more chef. So I, I'm a firm believer of increase, increasing the wage. So definitely. Um, I, but I have to agree with, with, with Mr. Jim Rogers. Um, you know, campaigning, figuring out this whole thing for myself. You know, I'm not a career politician. It's a learning curve. So I don't have the necessary relationships at the moment with business. But I think it's also important to check in with the business community as well as uh, 
advocate and be a voice for the people. So that's one of the things that I definitely would do is try to find out what both sides want and if we can bring any innovation to the table. Can we find a way to increase the profits for some of these businesses so that we can also uh, pay um, our residents without any difficult uh, difficulties or uh, tapping into the bottom line of some of the business. I'm not necessarily pro-business, but I'm very pragmatic. I like to weigh information and then make sound decisions that way. Thank you, that's a very good question. I'm certainly uh, a proponent for raising minimum wage. Who wouldn't be? Um, but me personally, I didn't wait for wage uh, to increase. I did whatever I took. I come from old school, whatever it took to move myself forward, whether it's apply myself, get the education, uh, move the standard, move the bar, whatever it took, but that's me. I don't expect everybody to be me. So on that, yes, I am a proponent of minimum wage, but uh, I certainly go along with some of the candidates and what they spoke about, you have to be careful. I have spoken to several businesses uh, on the waterfront, lower cutting, on 23rd, on San Pablo, and they were cautious. And they were very uh, skeptical. And they told me why, the, the, the reasons, the healthcare costs, the, their employees not doing enough of the work, and that kind of thing. That's why we need clear communication. I don't mind bringing the wages up as a previous employer, but we have to talk to the employees. They have to understand that, okay, we're gonna do this, but we have to do the right thing. And that means that we have to work not harder, smarter, smarter and do everything we can so we can have a mutual agreement to maybe bring it up some, wait a little bit longer to bring it up uh, further. But at least we go together, and we move together and forward, and have a commitment. Uh, because we don't want nobody to run out of Richmond, especially businesses. We need our people to stay here. And Gordo Martinez. Yes, unfortunately, we're living in a time where productivity, productivity is going up at the same time that wages are going down. So that means that all the profits, that the hard work that we're doing is going to the owners of